Welcome, aloha. Thanks so much for joining us on Think Tech Hawaii, the rule of law and the new abnormal. And today we have two exceptional women leaders to talk to us about women leadership, what it brings, why it's needed, especially in these times. We have Professor Vanelia Randall, Professor Emerita from the University of Dayton School of Law, and also with a historical background in a prior career in nursing, an amazing combination. And Tina Patterson, mediator, arbitrator, business consultant, and advisor, and also a person of many diverse experiences and awarenesses. Professor Tina, if someone were to ask you whether you believe that we need to see more women in leadership now and why, what thoughts might come to mind for you? Well, I, I, I would have a, a conflicted answer, as you can imagine. I think, that we need more women in leadership as, in order to uh, make sure that issues that are important to the communities that those women come from are on the table and addressed. However, I think that we have to remember that uh, women leadership doesn't change the system. They are a part of the system. And so whatever they do, whether they're Black progressives, they're going to do it within the context of the system itself. And if, like me, you believe that the system is the fundamental problem, then advocating for more leadership without constantly reminding people that they can't change the system. They can just uh, kind of ease the pain. The, the women in, in systemic leadership can ease the pain. So that would be my response. Yeah, fantastic. And it raises the question, Tina, do you have any sense as to whether women may be better in dealing with that tension, that conflict, that balance, than the male leaders, at least those we've had? I do think that women leaders, one, their perspective, because as what Professor Randall indicated, many women are juggling multiple demands, competing demands. And sometimes those com competing demands can be both um, hit on both a personal and a professional level. And as we see oftentimes in the media, there's no distinction made between the two. So I, I do think that women are both inherently in many ways able to, to, to both juggle, but also know when this is, this is really personal. Yes, it's coming to the forefront in my professional life, but I'm making the choice to either not let that be my focus. I think there's also this idea of emotional intelligence as well as intellectual intelligence. I'm not saying that men aren't both, but we see with women, there's also, this seems to be for many women, not all women, it's a, a, a part of the, who they are in terms of in, engaging and negotiating and interacting with others and trying to be problem solvers instead of I'm going to take this hard tactic line and, and not, not consider the other. Now, having said that, and we see this in studies, women are oftentimes less inclined to take that that lead role and some of it is as professor randall mentioned it's systemic you've been told for years you know you need to be quiet um you need to you know you can be at the table but you really shouldn't say anything and if somebody else takes credit you know just chin up take one for the team so while it yes i think there there are aspects that are better there's still the systemic the unconscious bias the microaggressions and sometimes it's not micro, it's just out and out presentation and, and how someone is presented 
um, one of the things you asked about was preparing for today's session. I thought about Fran Drescher and what she's going through as the president of SAG. Um, I read an article written by the Washington Post. I have to say it was highly disappointing. It focused on the fact that she had played um, in a sitcom over two decades ago as a nanny. That is not who she is today. And th that story missed the fact that she brought that story to that station or to that channel and said, you know, here's a story. They bought into it, knowing that she was going to highlight these aspects. But the article tended to focus on that versus here's an impact to our economy if these people are on strike and how many other organizations will recognize the striking group and, and not engage in their work because they are now aligned with um, an alliance with. No, and that's a great insight because as you indicate, she brought them an opportunity to understand a really, really important imbalance, tension, conflict between workers and the people who hold power over workers, over their lives, and over the lives of lots of people, not just actors, but hairdressers, custodians, landscapers, everybody involved in the industry. It's a huge number and range and diversity of people. And instead of that, they scaled back and they focused on one small aspect, a stereotypical and actually fictional aspect of this person's life. When they were offered the opportunity to say, look how much truth there is here that you can help people understand. And they completely missed that. I gotta think that almost has to have been a male reporter who did that. I can't imagine another woman doing that to her. I would hope. I can't imagine that. Awesome. I can, imagine. I can imagine a lot of it. I don't. I think that. I think that there's the that we like to talk about women in roles of leadership, which I think we need, and women in more women in the in uh, in lines of promotion, whatever career or jobs they're doing, which is absolutely important. But my view is, is that, and, and it may be, which is the cat, you know, chasing the tail, which come first, but oftentimes women, they know how their bread is buttered and so they are going to take uh, some of the same positions and do some of the same things that uh, that men in those positions do. I have not experienced uh, women in position of a power who do things against the system. And they I might be to... nicer. They may have more emotional intelligence. They may go about it in a way that makes me feel better. In fact, I have a, a, a student, uh, visit, a student that, that I hadn't seen for a long time, was in Orlando and called me up to visit, and uh, and we were sort of talking about this because uh, she had requests under two different deans. One was a man dean and one was a woman dean. And she was angry at the man dean because of the way he had uh, done something. But then when I, but when I pointed out that the woman did the same, same thing, that she, she didn't get a different result from the woman. She just got a woman who treated her nice. She got a person who treated her nicer uh, and made her feel heard. And I'm not saying that's important, not important. I'm just saying that if you're looking for results and that uh, women don't often give different results in situations like this than men. You know, Jack, and you make a very good you. point. Yeah, the go Washington ahead. Post, I'm sorry, I hate to disappoint you, Chuck, but the Washington Post article that I'm referring to is written by a woman. 
Ouch. Sorry. So maybe for every Rachel Maddow, there's a Maria Bartiroma, or for every Nancy Pelosi, there's a Marjorie Taylor Greene or a Lauren Boebert. That's a scary thought, yeah. But then when even when you look at Rachel Maddow, Rachel Maddow has consistently worked within the STEM system. If you look at how she tailored her, she doesn't go to the left. She doesn't. She's real. I loved Rachel Maddow when she first got on, and I was really excited. But then I began to see the pattern of how she's left, but she's not far left. And she's not advocating for changes in the system that would undermine the system. She's advocating for a better functioning system. And, and 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 I'm not saying that's not needed. And I think that's what we can expect from women. I've been to tell you the truth, but because I ragged on her so bad, I must admit how surprised I have been by Judge Brown. Uh, I've been surprised because she's come up with some she's been aggressive in her questioning which in the context of law, that's essential. Uh, silent, if you, especially if you don't have, you can change how, not the votes, but how people think about things by the questions you ask. And she's been aggressive in her question sheet. She's been quest questioned in her, uh, her response writing uh, dissents, which is, uh, is kind of unheard of, the number of dissents she actually writes from a young judge. And she's come up with some novel theories. I think the whole concept of original progressiveness, which is a concept, she doesn't articulate it that way, but that's what she's arguing, that the Constitution and the amendments were progressive. And we and if you want to adopt the original language, then you have to adopt a progressive view of the world. Uh, I, and she did that. She's done that with the equal protection, which I think she's exactly right. So I've been I'm real, real surprised. So again, she's working within the system, but she's doing a good job. So that's a great example. Are there other women who are examples of the kind of leaders that can actually bring about change and how people see and think about things that may impact the system and its evolution? I saw a good example last week. Um, thinking about the NATO public forum, I was very much impressed with the Prime Minister of Estonia. Small nation, but she is an active player in what is happening in NATO and what is happening in that region. She, um, she I know she didn't do it single-handedly. She has others working with her, but to make Estonia a, a, a place where this ta the tactical games and tactical work could be done. And for her to hold this conversation was one, both impressive, but also, shifted the conversation from just having the military representatives present and having really this male dominated conversation. She's at the table, she knows what she's talking about, but she also recognizes she's not a force of one. Um, on a slightly different note, another person who got my attention and I would think of in terms of leadership, um, Christine, and I'm gonna, I may mispronounce her last name, but um, it's Mahwanda. She's an anchor and correspondent with um, Dutcha Welle. She is by African descent, but she was the moderator. And in this rarefied space, we very rarely see, I'm gonna say African and black women. The fact that she's probably under the age of 45 also was a significant factor. She held her own. She kept the attention of the panel, but she also kept the attention of the audience. And because of her age, she was able to balance the online participation with the, those who are in the room. I see her as a rising star. Um, 
I don't know what form I'll see her in again, but I was very much impressed because it's easy enough in those spaces for her to either be overlooked or treat it in such a way that she's considered not to bring value to the table. And she definitely hit hit the nail on the head in both regards. That's wonderful. Those are great examples. And one of the things I especially love about those, especially the Estonian prime minister, is she brought home in ways no one else did or could that she was speaking not just for herself in Estonia, but for all of the small Central European countries who are next if we don't stand up to Putin and his very World War II like, very Nazi like, criminal invasion of a sovereign country. Absolutely. I, I'm impressed. I don't want to, to keep um, on this. But I also want to talk about the president of the um, Native American Bar Association. That when we talk about sovereignty, and this is something in the U.S. that we still struggle with, whether we're talking about nations, First Nations on the West Coast, East Coast, or in the Midwest, it, one, acknowledging the sovereignty, but also recognizing that those who serve in the legal capacity what rule of law really means. We can't, it can't be a roll of dice. Well, today we're going to follow this law. No, there are 33 federally recognized nations. They have a right. And we, we determine when it's comfortable, which, which right we want to acknowledge. Um, I applaud her because she is bringing to the forefront things such as we need potable water. Oh, diabetes is on the rise. It's because we have food deserts. Oh. You can't, people can't get in contact with one another. It's because we don't have the telecommunications necessary for us to have basic conversations with the person in the next community. And they suffer from the refusal of the United States to really uh, recognize their obligation under the treaties. Okay. That, 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 that if the United States, the United States has never taken their treaty obligation uh, very seriously, and uh, and because of that, they they suffer from that. And I agree with you. Uh, her advocacy for the sovereign nations uh, is has been exceptional. I apologize. I don't remember her name right now, but she's. Me, she, me like neither. Professor said she's she's doing an outstanding job and bringing the awareness. I know at the American Bar Association annual conference, one of the awardees of the Thurgood Marshall Award is from one of the First Nations. Um, you know, I, and I hope this isn't just oh we're going to do this for 2023. This needs to be an ongoing conversation because we see parallels when we talk about what's happening in terms of sovereignty with our First Nations in terms of sovereignty for the United States and other countries abroad. And, and it's, not a, it's not a singular um, effort. It's not a singular activity. The geopolitical instability that we see abroad is reflected here and vice versa. No, that's exactly right. And that points to another example, maybe another good one of why we need women in leadership and, and what that can bring is Deb Holland as the Secretary of the Interior. Absolutely. Not only the first Indigenous American to hold that position, but she's the first one to actually focus it on trying to understand and live up to obligations that are not just conceptual, like, yeah, the U.S. and the DOJ said, we protect your water rights, but we're not going to convert that into anything specific that actually gives you real water. It's just a conceptual obligation. But but one of the things we need to be careful, and I, I must, we can't put women in for women's sake. Correct. We can't put Black people in for Black people's sake. Because if their politics are no good, all you have is, you. Ha it's worse then no black person at all or no woman at all. Because when a woman who 
think Mar Marjorie Taylor Smith or whatever her name is, Green or whatever, when a woman gets up and says racist, sexist, homophobic things, it endorses it. It says to people who don't know any better or who don't, aren't willing to think any further that if a woman will do it, then it must be okay. And so I'm going to do it too. It pushes, it gives permission for other people in authority to lock on in a way that, the, in a more overt way, that they might not do it. So I, I am not for women in leadership just to have them. I think that we have to always look at the politics we're promoting. And if there's a white male running uh, for some office or doing something that in a leadership role that is politically better than a black woman, then I'm gonna go with the white male because I'm about results politically. And uh and 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 we have to do that, uh, I think. Well, and I Aren't think that's you it's exactly <laughs> what Tina was alluding to, which is if you look at the resources that are available in Black women leadership, in Indigenous women leadership, there are more than enough truly outstanding individuals and resources. Hey, Politically correct, outstanding. I concur with that. How do we open those doors? Well, part of what I feel, we have to not be afraid of mentoring, grooming people below us. We have, we, I think sometimes, and this may have changed, but sometimes there is a truism. If there's only one, that sometimes the system only wants one woman, one white woman, one black woman, and we become fearful that we won't be the one. And there may be a justification for that fear. Uh, because too often when there's more than one, sooner or later they find a reason to get rid of the extra one. And, and the older one may be fearful that they'll be the ones that they got gotten rid of. So we have to, we have to, we have to work on overcoming that fear and mentor people all the way down the line, all the way, uh, you know, from from elementary school all the way up through the pipeline, a term that I hate. But uh, but we have to mentor people and get make sure that we get people um, hired, even though there's justified fear of what those people may or may not do, because you know. People lie when they're interviewing for jobs, so you never know for sure whether you are meant get you getting what you think you're getting when you get when you. But you gotta you gotta take that risk. You've got to uh, do the best you can in promoting people up through the pipeline, and but promoting people up through the pipeline, uh, but like. This is a, my kids and I are going to read. My thirteen-year-olds and I are going to read um, Howard Zinn's People History. They're going to be taking history in the eighth grade, uh, uh, Florida history, and I wanted to be sure that they didn't walk away with an idea that it was accurate history, uh, and so. We've got to mentor the young people. We've got to educate our own children, our own daughters. We have to make sure that they have the political history and skills 
necessary to get promoted up so that when they get into the pipeline, they can become a force for good instead of a force for maintaining the system. And that reminds us that for this to happen, the mentoring, the cultivation, the development of these truly well-qualified and appropriately gifted leaders, we need the groups, we need the coalitions, we need the teams. Where are those now that you see, Tina, in our last couple of minutes here? Oh, I see them in the social organizations that we belong to. I see them in churches. I see them business owners. I agree with everything that Professor Randall said, but I would also add knowing the difference between a mentor and a sponsor. To, to sometimes get into these spaces, we need sponsors. Absolutely. And for younger people, understanding that a sponsor is not a mentor and a mentor is not a sponsor. A sponsor is going to use their social capital. They are going to make those, those introductions. They are going to use their influence so that you can have a seat at the table. They may be the person who actually defends your being um, invited to have a seat at the table and nurturing those relationships, but also saying to, you know, in these groups, in these spaces, it doesn't happen overnight. And I, I, I can't emphasize that enough. It doesn't happen overnight. You have to nurture that relationship. So they're there, but it, it does take, and it's not going to be a matter of, oh, Chuck, can you, you know, I, I think you should be a sponsor. Observe, watch. What are you seeing? What are you reading? Where are you? Where are you spending your time and energy? And I realize we have one minute left, so I'll, I'll leave the floor. Don't tell you, it's okay. It's okay. We're going to run over. But And you're right. And those sponsors, those champions may also very well include allies. Yes. And yes, those, absolutely. Those parts of the coalition have to be productive. Professor Randall, you were going to add, we're in our last minute, so. I just keep trying to read, but unless you're at the very top of the pyramid, everyone is working to try to get improved. It, the, the, the sponsor is being sponsored. That it it is not a okay, I've gotten this, I'm a president in a, in, in, of, a, of, of a university, and so now I can just sponsor all these people below me. No, you are being sponsored by someone who helped you navigate into that position. Uh, and, and so we have to remember that as well. No, and that's critical. Those teams, those groups, those coalitions have to be effective parts of the system. Tina, last words? You want to wrap us up? Oh, my gosh. Um, to be young, gifted, and Black. It, it, <laughs> that's where it's at. <laughs> that's where it's at. I'll, yes, I concur with you. Or as we used to say when I was a kid, right on. So, <laughs> yeah, it, it is, um, it's a journey. It's a journey. And for those of you that want to partake the course, um, be encouraged. Be encouraged. There are a lot of people who will say no. Don't listen to them. Find those who will say yes, who will lift you up, who will push you forward, who will also pull your coattails and tell you, going down the right path, you need to course correct. Yeah. It's possible. And maybe that's a good place to wrap up, is to help everyone understand and remember, choose to be part of those movements, those groups, those coalitions. Choose for your own learning and your own richness of experience, as well as what you can help make possible for those who can help bring about the kind of change that's going to help that movement grow. Professor Randall, Tina, thanks so much for your time. Thanks all of you for joining us on Think Tech Hawaii. Come Thank back you. In a couple of weeks, we'll be back. Have a great weekend, all. Take care and aloha.
Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please click the like and subscribe button on YouTube. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Check out our website, thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.